You see by the clock, it is nine minutes and holding. The problem has been the weather. It has been raining down there at the Kennedy Space Center, uh, and the cloud cover has been a bit of a problem, so much of a problem that they've had Bob Crippen, who is manning the weather plane, flying from one end of the runway and around the area, checking to see whether that cloud cover will be adequately sparse so that they can still make this launch within the 30 to 35 minute window that is available to them tonight. What is happening at the moment is that the five-man crew is aboard the Space Shuttle Challenger. They are waiting for the countdown, as indeed we are, waiting for the countdown to resume. If it cannot resume because of weather conditions, within the next, oh, 30 minutes or so, then the uh, mission will have to be scrubbed probably until tomorrow morning at 2 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time. There you can see the Space Shuttle uh, as she waits on the gantry on the launch pad. Uh, quite literally within minutes of takeoff, but because of earlier in the evening there were uh, really dramatic thunder squalls and you could see the lightning uh, framed against the pad, uh, but this evening now the rain has moved off, the clouds have moved off, there is only a slight uh, drizzle in the area from what I'm told, uh, and let's take a look now and listen to the voice of shuttle control. However, Chances are they would be able to resume the countdown. Just depends on uh, where it could be picked up at uh, the next even minute, taking into consideration that the uh, engineer back at the GLS console needs uh, between 30 seconds and a minute in order to put the, uh, his program in a proper configuration. So uh, we have received uh, somewhat of a, of a clearance as far as the Air Force Weather Office is concerned. However, managers here still discussing the options uh, we have people involved uh, from headquarters, uh, the Johnson Space Center, Kennedy Space Center, all very heavily involved in discussions and uh, being able to resume the count this morning for the liftoff of STSA. Uh, conditions have uh, improved somewhat over the past few minutes. Uh, weather reconnaissance flights uh, conducted by pilot Bob Crippen uh, show uh, no precipitation, uh, particularly important in that uh, layer of clouds at about the 9,000 foot level. We'll continue to stand by and wait word from the mission management team as to uh, our ability to resume the countdown for the launch of STSA. T minus nine minutes and holding. This is shuttle launch control. We have a uh, moderately optimistic word from shuttle launch control. The indication being that if the launch team can, the management team can get it all together in the next couple of minutes, uh, that probably the launch or the countdown will resume very shortly. In the interim, we're going to take a look at the man. This is a, a, a launch of several firsts, the first nighttime launch, uh, the launch with the oldest astronaut on board, a 54-year-old, and, of course, the first time that a black American astronaut goes into space. And my colleague, Lynn Schur, has a profile of Guy Bluford. Lieutenant Colonel Guy Bluford of the Air Force was less than a year old when the nation's first black fighter pilots went into combat overseas. And today at age 40, while he doesn't call himself an activist, he does acknowledge the accomplishments of the pilots who preceded him. Uh, I think I owe a debt to them in the sense that they knocked down a lot of the barriers that I don't have to face. He's been training practically since his childhood in Philadelphia, when he decided to become an aerospace engineer, a decision supported by his father, a mechanical engineer, and his school teacher mother. I think the biggest legacy my parents left me was feeling that I could be and do anything that I wanted to, and that really has been very helpful along the way. After graduation from Penn State, he took pilot training with the Air Force, later flying 144 combat missions in Vietnam. By the time he joined NASA in the astronaut class of 1978, he had also earned a master's and a doctorate in aerospace engineering. Bluford's NASA training has included work on the remote arm and on the shuttle's avionics system. He says that despite his historic role as the first American black in space, he doesn't feel any special pressure to perform. Uh, I recognize the fact that I'm the guy who's setting the pace for the people who are going to fly behind me, but I don't feel as if I have to be perfect as well. Well, that... That, of course, was Guy Bluford, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Guy Bluford, who is sitting there in the flight engineer seat as Challenger is waiting on the pad while the people on the ground decide whether or not the spaceship can be launched and whether the weather 
is clearing enough in order to get off within the next, oh, 25 or 30 minutes. Uh, Guy Bluford, incidentally, acknowledged a debt to some of the black airmen who flew before him, the fellows who made it possible for blacks to fly at all. And, of course, tonight, uh, it's, it's a big honor for NASA that three of the original black pilots who were called the Tuskegee Airmen because they trained down at Tuskegee Airfield in Alabama, they are here tonight as special VIP guests. Uh, George Roberts, Lemuel Custis, and Charles Dubow were among, were three of the first five who ever flew at that airstrip, and they are here tonight to watch uh, their colleague, now Guy Bluford, go up in space. So this is indeed a, a very special moment for them. Also here tonight, Barbara Lawrence. Uh, Barbara Lawrence is the widow of Major Robert Lawrence, who was, in fact, the first black astronaut in this country. Major Robert Lawrence was an Air Force astronaut. Uh, selected in 1967, unfortunately was killed in an aircraft accident before he ever got a chance to fly. So there are plenty of people paying tribute to Guy Bluford on this occasion. Ted? Well, Lynn, it is still T minus nine and holding, and the fact that we have a little more of a hold here than we had anticipated gives us an opportunity, as you just did, to introduce our viewers to several members of the crew. And next, we want to take a look at the man to whom I referred just a moment ago, the oldest man to go into space, Dr. William Thornton, 54 years old, and ABC's science editor Jules Bergman gives us a profile now of him. At 54, Dr. Bill Thornton will be the oldest astronaut ever to fly. Thornton grew up in North Carolina, where he was trained first as a physicist and later as a medical doctor at the University of North Carolina. He is married and the father of two grown sons. As a child, uh, I could never see an airplane go over without uh, looking up and watching it. Still can. Thornton came to NASA in 1967 and has waited 16 long years to fly as a mission specialist on STS-8, where his primary job would be to study the space sickness problem using himself as a subject of many of his inquiries. Well, I shan't try to make myself sick. Conversely, if it happens, I will take maximum advantage of it. Uh, might even consider myself fortunate if I do. And uh, yes, I shall be the uh, subject of my uh, own menstruations here. During his career at NASA, he has been a crew member of a 56-day long Skylab endurance simulation test and then part of the support crew for the Skylab missions. Thornton, who holds more than 35 patents, personally developed the treadmill, which provides the astronauts with the in-flight exercise needed to keep their muscles toned while weightless. A lot of old concepts are being put to rest. There are 20-year-olds that, if I may use the word, are wrecks in contrast to some very active 60-year-olds, uh, shall we say. And that's what it means to me, is that we simply recognize the fact that it is uh, really performance and not calendar years that count. The day we did that interview, Bill Thornton had been in the simulator until 9 p.m., then he'd come out and run at the gym until midnight. Go, gone home, gotten a fast five-hour sleep, then gotten up to do the interviews with Lynn and myself and the rest of the newsmen. Two years ago, by the way, that man, Dr. Bill Thornton, quite possibly the most brilliant single astronaut here, who holds nearly 50 patents, was asked to resign by NASA officials here, who I won't name. He refused. And those these flets he's flying today. Lynn? Well, thank you, Jules. We are now, uh, let's listen to shuttle control for just a minute. 23 minutes after the hour. They will resume the countdown. Which would be 2.23 this morning, giving us a launch at uh, 2.32 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Yeah, he was trying to figure it out. Okay, that's good news. The weather has cleared yeah, enough for them to... Start at T-minus 9 minutes in 30 seconds. Just within a minute now. Okay, we are going to resume the count and pick up we the count in about a minute. We do have a message from the White House that was sent by President Reagan to the flight crew for this morning's launch. Uh, it reads, uh, recently NASA's orbiting infrared observatory made a stunning discovery and has found that the star Vega, some 26 light years from Earth, is circled by an enormous ring or shell of particles that could be building blocks of a solar system. Okay, that is indeed good news, Gene Cernan. The count will resume. The weather has cleared. Lynn, there was never really any doubt in your mind, was it? Uh, 
And there it goes. The clock is moving. We uh, we are on our last uh, our last leg, as Sally said earlier. You know, you get to this point, I can certainly appreciate that we are only beginning to understand. Twenty-five years into the space age, our quest to explore the unknown goes on. The eighth mission of the space shuttle paves a new path to greater knowledge of our Earth and of the universe that surround us. Also, with this effort, we acknowledge proudly the first ascent of a black American into space. Challenger's mission will continue to expand the shuttle's capabilities to do things we have never before done in orbit, and it will mark the shuttle's first night launch and landing. I believe that we are truly on the threshold of a new freedom, the potential to probe the solar system with greater ease, less risk, and thus the ability to use space to enhance the well-being of all people. On the eve of this great adventure, Nancy and I send our best wishes for a safe and productive mission to Commander Dick Truly and his crew, Dan Brandenstein, Dale Gardner, Guy Bluford, and Bill Thornton. Good luck and may God go with you. Signed, Ronald Reagan. T-minus seven minutes, 50 seconds, and counting.